All right, let's get started. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I assume that a lot more people are connected <laughs> to the stream, or are they in the elevator? Probably not watching the stream because there is no Wi-Fi in the elevator. Um, but they get the real thing in a second. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have Lauren Crawford here. He's the RGSS Assistant Professor of Biostatistics at Brown, and is also a core faculty member of the Center for Statistical Science and the Center for Computational Molecular Biology. Um, before joining Brown, he received his PhD from the Department of Statistical Science at Duke, and he received the Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from Clark Atlanta University. So yeah, it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you. And oh yes, questions. Uh, Clarifying questions during the talk. No, of all kinds of we, questions we during the talk. <laughs> if you have questions that are comments, don't ask them. No, <laughs> I came and from, yeah, I came from you and not me. Right? Um, <laughs> no, thanks so much for having me. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I love seeing the view on the 12th floor. Um, I was trying to figure out like what I should talk about today, but then I realized since I'm going to be in a room with a lot of interdisciplinary people who have all these kind of skill sets, why not do something that's kind of fun? That's like on the side of what we do. Um, so, so just as a clarifying thing of what I'm going to talk about today, um, my, my group likes to take a lot of uh, uh, complex machine learning type methods and, and really develop theory that enable their interpretations to be related back to genome principles. And so what we like to do is we like to uh, dissect the complex architecture of, of, of traits um, past additivity. And so I'd like to show this slide um, because what we do is we take, we want to take this total phenotypic variation of a given trait. Um, and we like to try to break it down not only into its genetic and environmental components, but we also try to understand uh, how the genetic components can be dissected into not just additivity, but nonlinearities, right? So you can think about this as gene A plus gene B, but also try to understand the interactions of gene A times gene B, right? Or gene A times its environment, per se. Um, and so a big part of my group is we, stuck, we focus on statistical epistasis or this idea of genetic interactions, gene A times gene B. Um, and we try to do this across a bunch of complex traits. And so uh, this is a study of different mice phenotypes from 139 different uh, traits broken down in these different groups. And we like to try to understand how additive effects play a role, but also how maybe pairwise effects, third order effects, or even uh, G by E common environmental effects might break down for every single trait. right? So today what I'm going to talk about is uh, not complex traits in the way that you might think about them, but with shapes. Okay, so, so part of my group has become uh, genetics and genomics, uh, but then another part of us has started to under, try to ask this question of when can you use genotypic information or phenotypic information to study uh, shape variation, right? Or the other way around, when can shape variation be used as a proxy to understand phenotypic or genotypic variation? Uh, and so you're going to see a lot of this today from uh, a lot of anthropology type studies. Uh, where we're going to study uh, bones of primates a lot. Uh, but you could do this with any kind of shape that could be represented as a mesh, and we'll kind of walk through this. Uh, this is a very like different and new thing, and I like this because it kind of combines all the stuff going into my group into like one uh, kind of weird framework. Uh, so a lot of this is going to be very comp bio focused, but there are a lot of pure math aspects to this, and a lot of theoretical aspect to this. So I'm going to be very honest on like what we don't know. And some like really cool questions that I hope people would be interested in working on. Um, so the presentation outline of what I'm going to give today is we're going to talk about a previous work in shape statistics, uh, this idea of how we typically compare shapes. Uh, and I'm going to introduce this idea of topological summary statistics. So my group does a lot of TDA, so studying how uh, topological changes over these meshes can be used to, as, as features that we can map back and forth. Yes. Yes. TDA. Yes. 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 Uh, and then we're going to show a, a prediction-driven application in radiomics that uh, is going to be out in JAS, I think, sometime this month, uh, where we take the topology of brain tumors and use those as data to predict disease-free survival in patients. Um, and how this study, how we use this study as a uh, as a as a as a uh, boost or a motivation for this idea of Sinatra. I'm going to be honest, Sinatra stands for something like sub-image, something, something. Uh, but I like the name Sinatra because it kind of encompasses all the stuff that we do as a group. And so Sinatra is a pipeline for doing variable selection, things past prediction with 3D objects and 3D meshes, right? So if I have a cl two classes of shapes, how do, I do, how do I study the variation between those two groups? And then can I actually map onto the physical characteristics of these shapes that explain that variation? Um, and so um, I'll talk about the algorithmic overview of this. 
uh, Sinatra as a pipeline. So what I'll say over and over today is uh, I'm gonna outline four steps and I'm gonna describe how we do these four steps. If you don't like those, any of those four steps, you can take that pipe out and put your favorite thing in that place. Uh, and so we're, I'm gonna introduce this idea of relative centrality measures, which is like an, uh, a, a post hoc um, variable selection measure that we use for nonlinear and machine learning type methods. Uh, Sinatra has a really cool reconstruction and visualization enrichment thing, and then I'll show how we do simulations of real data classifications. And I would like to have a lot of people who think about theory to think about this simulation idea, and I'll talk about why that in itself is an innovation and things that we can actually do better moving forward. Um, so the history of shapes is, is quite interesting. Uh, classical shape statistics represented 3D objects as these landmarks. And so what you would do is you would take some complex uh, object, you put these landmarks, often expert derived, uh, onto the shape, and these landmarks would be almost like a lower representation of what that shape would, would look like, right? And so uh, over time, in uh, biological morphometrics, what we've done is we've created methods that generate semi-automatically defined landmarks, right? So this is a tooth, these are teeth from primates, and so you're gonna see this a lot. This is a plant eater, this is a bug eater. And what you do to compare the difference of the uh, uh, morphology of these two shapes is you place these landmarks and you have a distance function, right? Between the uh, XYZ coordinates of where these landmarks live. And so you can define some, uh, like for Krusty's distance on this, and then you can model how similar these shapes might be to each other. Yeah. Okay. Fine question, yeah. but do you know which tooth belongs to a plant eater versus a meat eater just by looking at it? I, I know because I know this study, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, so a lot of these, of the studies I'm going to show today, there's a, we work with, uh, in this, Doug Boyer is a guy who works at Duke. He does a lot of anthropology type things, and so he actually classifies a lot of these, uh, these teeth, yeah. Um, I myself am not an anthropologist, um, but a lot of the stuff that we do, we always work with people who might know how to, uh, how to study these objects. Um, so the issues with landmark-based uh, approaches is something that I just mentioned, which is uh, geometric morphometrics are awfully uh, limited to simple pairwise comparisons, right? And you also can be biased if you don't know exactly where your landmark should be placed, right? Um, there are also these ideas of requiring a metric, so where if if two shapes have not been properly aligned, you might have two landmarks that may not correspond that well to each other, right? So if you don't have correspondence between shapes, it might be hard to compare across them. Um, I'm gonna mention another method, uh, this, another issue in a second, but also with these landmarks, doing classic variable selection with these landmarks is quite hard because you can't just take a, a bunch of landmarks and throw them into a regression type me method, right? The idea of what is an effect size for an ordered pair is, is something that's not quite straightforward. And so we'll talk about how we're gonna get around this. Um, we're gonna focus on this idea that new shapes and new shape technologies now create these meshes where you can, where you can represent 3D objects as like a mesh. So basically a collection of vertices, edges, and faces. So we can do these like triangularizations over objects where this is a, this is a tumor. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do these sweeps over these uh, triangular meshes, okay? Um, so since data can be represented in this way, we're going to take advantage of this new representation. And that's where TDA has really became a big part of this space, right? And so the main objectives of, of, of my group's work is we want to take shapes, we want to transform the information in this 3D structure to statistics uh, that we can use in a wide range of regression or machine learning type methods, whether they be in neural networks, but also in just basic generalized linear models. Um, we want the desired transformation to be injective. And what that means is when I take the shape and I transform it to a, a statistic that represents its morphology, once I understand the parts of that statistic that are most important, I want to then be able to map back onto the original shape what I was looking at originally. And so we're going to use topology uh, to do this. And there, there have been a lot of work and people that have, that have focused on this, persistence landscapes, um, persistence homology transform, and OA characteristic transform. I'm going to explain these Pre these, these last two uh, in detail because that's what we uh, build our work off of. Um, but all these methods work at, at trying to solve this question. Um, so I kind of like this idea of Picasso. Uh, so uh, effectively what we want to do is have we have a, uh, we have a bunch of complex objects. Uh, we want to represent them uh, via the, the, the holes of, of uh, this lower dimensional space. 
and then be able to map back uh, kind of what's happening here uh, in, in terms of the, the actual objects that we observe. And so we're going to start with this, this fundamental idea of persistence homology. Um, and persistence homology is this idea of studying uh, these, these different uh, simplicial complexes. So we're going to study uh, vertices, edges, and then these triangles you can think as faces. Okay? And we're going to study how uh, these homology groups uh, evolve over time, over some like filtration. I'll give an illustration of how this works. Okay? So effectively what we're going to do is we're going to place some, uh, some points around our object in space, some uniform points. And with some radius, I'm going to grow balls around each of these points and study when features of this object live and die. Right? And I'm going to track when these features are up here. Okay? And so persistent homology tracks the, the evolution of homology groups. Okay? So this is kind of how this works in practice. We have these, uh, these uh, disparate points uh, across these things. And I'm just going to grow balls over certain uh, radii. What you can see is uh, as I grow these balls, certain balls become connected to the other ones, right? So this is like when a feature is born, right? Here we have a line here. We have a line here and here. I continue this process. Now I have a few faces. Continue this process until I have just one connected component, OK? Now what we're going to do while we're doing this filtration is we're going to track when these homology groups uh, uh, occur, OK? Uh, so I think less than might be. Oh, <laughs> uh, and so we could track when these how these features are born and die over uh, what we call uh, uh, barcodes. Okay, so uh, here again, I have the same image as I just showed, but broken up. What we're going to do is we're going to start connecting components over and over again across this filtration, and I'm going to track when vertices uh, get attached to each other. Right, so certain vertices will start to die and become just one. Uh, component, so I track how long a, a particular feature persists, right? This idea of persistent homology, okay? And so when something, uh, at one point I have just one long kinetic component, which symbolizes here, and I just track as long as, cer as certain features die. Another way to do this is what we call a birth and death time uh, plot over a, what we call a persistence diagram, okay? So the same sort of idea. I'll start with a filtration coming up. We'll start. I have a feature that is born here connected to this thing. This is when it's, uh, when it's uh, uh, on the x axis, when that feature uh, becomes alive. Another feature is born. Another feature is born here. Now at this point, these two features become connected, right? So this feature here died. It became, and so it was plotted here. And we do that all the way up until I've finished my entire filtration. So what people do with uh, persistence diagrams is you say that these features are most likely not that interesting because they didn't persist a long time, whereas things far off the diagonal are things I'm probably most interested in. Right? Um, and so we can actually do real data analysis with this stuff. Um, and so these are maze routes from a company that I used to intern for uh, in Durham when I was a grad student, uh, uh, High Fidelity Genetics where we showed in this company with this imaging technology they had of, of maze roots, where if you study the topology of maze roots, you can actually map onto how long uh, or, or how much yield an actual crop will produce. And so these are different seeds. And so uh, we took these roots. We do these persistent sweeps over them. You get these different persistent features for each uh, seed. And then we mapped whether or not the difference between these seeds and then uh, use, the, use these type of features as fingerprints for how much yield a particular crop might produce. Yes? Could this be just over evolutionary time or over, over filtration? So, so, uh, filtration that you do or something nature does? Uh, so, so something that we, we specified the rate of which you're going to evolve this thing. So there's, there's a parameter in there which is like how, so it's not as continuous like of a sweep, so it is discretized. And so how many steps you take as you filter these balls out now is a parameter you need to choose. Um, so the filtration is like a, 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 a mapping of, of the, the balls that you drew right, onto right. the actual Off, physical object. Onto the physical thing, yeah. The, the, the artifact you're starting with, and then you're starting with a bunch of, a, a simple model of it, and then you're making it more complicated. The complicated as you grow out, yeah. And so what you could do is you could take those distance, those distance features that I had before. You can specify how a distance function between these diagrams and then figure out how, how interesting they are. Now, this is with 2D maze roots is what we uh, typically did. Um, but this idea of persistence homology transform for 3D shapes. 
Now the transform is very simple. It's taking what we do in 2D, but over, th over 3D rotations, okay? So what you do, uh, this is complicated math. In, in, in theory, what you do is you start with the, we start with a shape. You start with a filtration over a certain uh, region. You sweep over that shape. You collect its persistence diagram. You save it, and then you rotate the shape, and then you do it again, right? This idea that you're going to do it over all ro all positions over the unit sphere, so you have a, a you have a collection of diagrams that tell you about what the 3D view of that object actually is. Okay. So then, what you could do is you can study three dimensional objects via the collection of the persistence diagrams. Okay. So these are these are a bunch of bones. These are heel bones from primates. Uh, we have a bunch of them from 67 different genera. I take the collection of the persistence diagrams over all these different sweeps, I save them, and I can start to do things like clustering of how different the range of their diagrams change from group to group, okay? Um, again, you need to have some kind of domain expert to tell you whether or not these uh, groupings make sense. Um, and so there's not much you can do with these past that because, again, once I have a collection of diagrams, I still can't really do regression with these birth and death time pairs over these different rotations. Uh, but you still can do things like these nice clustering type algorithms to see whether uh, the topological profile of these bones are different from these different genres. Um, so once again, these are the, these are the uh, uh, pitfalls of the persistence diagram and the persistence homology transform. And so what my group wanted to do was to, to, to be able to do analyses like this, but what if I had a phenotype attached to it? So what if I had um, something, uh, uh, like height for humans, and I had all these bones, could I then study how the variation of these bones are attached to that, to that trait? Um, so not just doing classification, or not just doing uh, a clustering like this, but actually studying what parts of the bones separate this red group from this blue group, for instance. And so to do this, we wanted to create a, uh, a topological summary statistic that actually had a simple inner product structure that I could do regressions with. And so how we do this is we're going to use the Euler characteristic instead. So the lower characteristic idea is the same thing. We're going to study this, this topological evolution over these filtrations. But instead of doing these diagrams, these birth and death time pairs, I'm just going to count the vertices, edges, and faces over these simplexes, or the simplices as I move across this filtration. Okay? So how this, how this looks in practice is, let's say I have a hand here. <clears throat> this is going to be my final, uh, my final output. What we're effectively doing is we're going to filter the same way I was doing with the bone. But I'm just going to count the vertices, edges, and faces according to that, that, that equation over my filtration. Okay? Then I'll rotate the hand and I'll do the same thing. Okay? What that gives me is if I do this over all, things, uh, over all directions on the unit sphere, I'll concatenate all these curves together. And then I'll have a representation in vector form now of what the shape looks like according to its topology. Okay? And so now I get an actual like, design matrix where every row now is the as a topological summary statistic for that given shape, right? And everyone knows what to do with design matrices. Once I have data that's that's just in vector form, I can do any type of modeling that I want with it. Okay. Um, and so the Euler characteristic actually gives me a collection of curves that I actually want to work with. And so this allows for quantitative comparisons for the full scope of parametric and also non-parametric methodology. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you could have done something similar with a birth death matrix, right? You could have flattened it, for instance, and so concatenated. But it, I guess, would have been twi-dimensional. Right. But uh, the, other, the the so that's what the persistence landscape does. The problem with the landscape and the diagram is like um, over this filtration, there's no invertibility back, and so it misses that piece of it. Um, but you're right. We could have done that. What would be awesome is the persistence diagram actually gives you more information than the Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic is like a sufficient statistic, but it doesn't give you all the richness about the structure. And so what would be amazing is if you were able to kind of bridge that invertibility gap. We just haven't had to figure out how to do that. The Euler characteristic was the easiest way to do that thus far. But that's, a, that's a very cool question that a lot of people are kind of interested in. Um, so here's an example of how to use this in, in radiomics. So uh, Radiomics is basically the study of, of medical images. Uh, we have MRI scans from different uh, glioblastoma patients. This is like a pilot study. 
uh, from the TCGA where we have matched genomic and clinical information for each patient, okay? So our data looks something like this. We have these uh, uh, G, uh, GBM slices. Uh, we, uh, we cut out this, the, uh, uh, section out this uh, tumor because I don't really want to do the oil characteristic over the entire brain. Uh, the rest of it's noisy, so we just uh, crop out this tumor here. What we do with this tumor is we take these slices and then we figure out a way to create like a mesh-like form of this tumor. And I'll show you a video of that in a little bit. After we have this, we uh, do these sweeps and we get these nice curves for each rotation of this tumor over different directions. Okay. So once I concatenate all these curves, this is my data vector for this given patient. Okay. And we do this for all patients. Um, um, here we're going to use, I'm, I'm just going to introduce now this nonlinear regression method that we do. Um, I like to, we do a lot of GPs in, in my group, so we have these nice curves. Uh, we assume that these curves have some prior on them uh, from a Gaussian process. Uh, you can think about this kernel covariance function as measuring the similarity of the topological summary statistic between um, patient one and patient two, right? And we can do this with all patients, okay? And we're going to study the, this, this similarity in a nonlinear way, okay? And so we're not going to assume an added, additive relationship between the top lot of summary statistics and their phenotypes, their clinical correlates, but we're going to assume some like nonlinear type of uh, metric. I'm doing this here because I want to reintroduce this later when we do uh, variable selection. Um, and so what we did in this paper is we, we compared the other characteristics of three key types of tumor uh, characteristics. We took gene expression. Uh, tumor morphometry, and then volume and geometrics. And we're going to compare how effective or predictive these things are compared to the topological summary statistics. And we're going to do this for disease-free survival and overall survival. Um, and what we kind of saw here was something really interesting, where as we expected, like overall survival is really hard. To, like these are, there's no separation here. But the, the disease-free survival, we did see separation where this, this oil characteristic thing was actually uh, a, a better predictor than these uh, uh, other types of data. And this actually matches what you see in a lot of radiology studies where people had su have suggested that holes in necrosis within tumors is, are linked to different IDH, ID, IDH1 and P3CA mutational profiles. And so there actually is this thing of studying holes in tumors actually is a good predictor of, of, of relapse in patients. And, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, did you look at volume and this volume, like, let's say that yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah. So the, the, I think the issue with volume here is volume is really dependent on how you uh, uh, standardize these images, right? And yeah. so the volume, I think if we had thought a little bit more about what I want to do in the future is I think you want to combine all of these things together with space. And that'll actually give you a much better idea of what's happening. So here we don't consider spatial information at all, which we should and will, and I will bring this up again. Um, but what this had us thinking about, and according to the to studies, is there might be a, an idea of oncogene activity and shape. So as a quick molecular biology uh, tutorial really quickly, um, disease-free survival studies this idea of relapse. And so what happens in our bodies, you can think about our bodies as being well-oiled machines. Um, our, our, the cells in our body uh, proliferate or grow when they're supposed to, and when something happens, they apoptose and die, right, on, on command via signaling, okay? So what happens is, um, you can think about this as a molecular signaling cascade, where in a regular cell, growth signals come in and they talk to a certain gene, and over this cascade, the genes end up talking to each other, and then uh, at somewhere down the pathway, survival and proliferation happens, right? Now, in a lot of tumors, what ends up happening is regardless of this growth signal, you have some irregular mutation, missense mutation, deletion, whatever the case might be, this pathway or sets of pathways are, are constitutively active, and so survival and proliferation is always occurring, and you get this idea of, of, of uh, uh, tumors here. Now, relapse is this interesting thing where we have uh, our tumor resistance, in, in the case of the study that we were looking at, we have some drug target come in and block a, a signaling cascade, and that patient goes, the, two, the signaling goes away, the cell apoptosis or cancer cells apoptose, and then you have a person that looks healthy. These are with uh, melanoma tumors. Um, and then what happens over six or seven months later, the drug target, ir irrespective of the drug target still being applied, this proliferation and survival somehow happens downstream somewhere via another pathway, 
uh, some feedback loop and uh, you get patient C where uh, the cancer comes back and the drug no longer works. And so we have this idea of resistance to, to drug therapy. And so with the, the disease-free survival that we looked at was somehow uh, connected to that this process might be connected to this idea of, of shape, right? And so uh, my very uh, ambitious goal, according to my Sloan Fellowship, is this idea that you would be able to take uh, uh, there, if there is a, a connection between the genomic profile and, and 3D morphology of tumors, then what you would want to do is use tumor morphology as a proxy for what's happening to the genotypic information and then be able to map that as a fingerprint to, to particular drug strategies, right? And so what, we're, what we want to do is do things past prediction, but actually model whether variation in this, in this space is connected to variation that's happening here. Um, so um, I wrote this Sloan Fellowship, a little lofty of a goal. Um, turns out like soft tissues are super hard, but but uh, we can actually do this. So th this brought up Sinatra, which stands for subimage analysis using topological summary statistics. Um, somehow we made Sinatra fit. Um, uh, and Sinatra works via this in this pipeline, okay? So soft tissues are hard. And I'm going to get into this a little bit, but the reason why soft tissues are hard is because within group heterogeneity can be high. And so when you have in, within group he heterogeneity, if you don't somehow model that appropriately, doing cross group heterogeneity is also, you, you, you won't get any signal there. So what we start with were teeth from, from primates. And the reason why teeth actually work quite well is because evolution has decided that over millions of years the morphology of, given of, of a given tooth, right? If you eat bugs or plants, selection says your morphology has to be a certain way such that you're able to digest certain foods. And if they're not, then you obviously won't live. And so within group heterogeneity of a plant eater versus bug eater is quite low. And so that allows us to check whether our, our model is actually working correctly. Um, so Sinatra follows the same pipeline that I just kind of had. We take two objects or two groups of objects from different, uh, uh, different groups. We do these, these topological summary statistics over these filtrations for them. So we're going to collect uh, these Euler characteristic curves for each object in these two species. What we do is with these collections of curves, we're going to run them through your favorite variable selection. Um, I'm going to do like some nonlinear variable selection metric on here where we take these curves. We're able to highlight on these curves where uh, the, the regions that are most describing the best the variation between these groups. And because our mapping is invertible, you're able to take these red regions and then map them back onto the actual shape. And so what you're able to do is actually highlight physically what's separating variation between two classes of shapes. Um, so we do simulations on all that stuff. So I'm kind of excited to get to this part because there's some challenges and stuff that I kind of want, wish people would help me think about. Um, so like I said before, Sinatra is a pipeline. Again, if you don't like anything I'm going to show you, just remove the pipe and then stick your favorite thing in here. But the four general steps are just to represent the shape as a statistic that you can model, define some probability uh, model to be able to classify these shapes based on these statistics. You want, some, you want to derive an evidence of association, p-value, posterior inclusion probability, Bayes factor, or I'm going to show you this rate measure. And then you want to be able to project these measures back onto the original shape. Um, so I showed you the first one already. We did the, top, the other characteristic. I'm going to use, I'm going to stick with the space of GPs. Um, and so that is going to be our model of choice. Um, so now we need to derive an association measure for this thing. Um, so the reason I like GPs is because, as I said before, GPs kind of show you the whole picture, right? So linear models, you have this additive effect, you have this environmental type of effect, but then you're kind of missing maybe this piece, whatever this nonlinear piece might be. Um, in nonlinear methods, uh, machine learning, whatever the case might be, you live in this space here. The issue is, in linear regression, you have this interpretability metric, right? You have these effect sizes, these coefficients where you can do variable selection hypothesis testing with, right? So um, in my PhD, I worked a lot on this kernel trick issue. Uh, this idea that when I work in this p-dimensional space, so p being however many uh, uh, covariates I have, I can, if I know what my covariance function is, uh, that, that k term I showed you, then I can map from 
this p-dimensional space to this nonlinear functional space, right? And this is where we always do really nice predictions. We get we have really high predictive power here because we're seeing the entire pi that I showed. The issue is if I want to do if I want to understand how those nonlinearities are contributing to uh, things in the context of my actual data, there's no way to kind of make an inverse transformation back, right? And so when I was a PhD student, I kind of worked on being able to uh, solve this issue, being able to do really nice predictions here, but then figure out what that might mean in the context of my actual covariate data. And so we try to get this, around this idea that when you do nonlinear uh, models, the classic idea of variable selection is, is lost. And so um, we started with this idea of this effect size analog. And how this kind of works is uh, I like to juxtapose this next to linear methods because uh, I teach linear models now. Um, so in linear regression, what we have is we have some, some uh, we have our, our, our variable. You have this linear uh, combination of, of uh, data and these effects. And when you get some estimation of these effect sizes, is you do like a linear projection of your phenotype onto the column space of your data, right? And so a standard projection here is, is like generalized inverses, right? Like ordinary least squares with generalized linear least squares type of solution. For nonlinear methods, we kind of do the same thing, right? We can do the same thing. So instead of this uh, uh, f, we have some estimate of our function. Um, instead of projecting y into the column space of x, I project my nonlinear function onto the column space of x. And then I have what we have is a, uh, uh, we could use any kind of standard uh, projection here, but we're going to choose for simplicity to, as a way to kind of see what this might look like uh, in linear methods. We're going to have a, a generalized inverse also here. And so my PhD in this, in, uh, this JAS paper, we call this the an effect size analog, right? It's not the same thing as this, but it kind of gives you a weight that kind of summarizes in some way how these, how uh, once I fit this nonlinear model, what that might mean in the context of my actual data. And so in this JAS paper, what we show is that these weights are actually more predictive than these linear weights. So you get, if I ran a nonlinear method and I fit these weights um, and I ran uh, and I did a predictive analysis, these, pre these, predict these weights are as predictive as if I ran like an SVM or something like that uh, versus running like a linear mix model. Um, what we want to do with these weights is we want to use these weights for, for variable selection here. Okay. Um, so I went to Duke, so I'm a little Bayesian. Um, Oh, not by, it's not my choice. Uh, and so uh, let's say that we have some uh, model we're going to run some like MCMC to fit F. We're going to have some weights here, which are going to be a deterministic step. So every time my MCMC, I draw an F, I can draw like an implicit deterministic value for these beta tildes. So I can have this like implied posterior distribution for these beta tildes, right? Every time I see a new F, I can figure out what that me might mean in terms of beta, right? And that could be for any projection that you choose here, okay? Um, now, once I have these, I want to be able to do uh, variable selection with them. So if you notice from this process, I don't have sparsity or anything, right? If sparsity in my function space may not, my, may not mean sparsity in my original covariate space. Um, we don't get inclusion probabilities. We don't get uh, uh, p-values or anything like that. So what we created is this idea of uh, what we call centrality. Um, and I think it's kind of intuitive uh, when you think about it from a sports perspective. So, okay, so let's say that we have a collection of variables. Um, and these collection of variables have some sort of information with them together as a whole, right, as a network. Now what you could do is you can figure out the importance of each of those variables by figuring out how much information is lost in the posterior distribution with that variable not being around, right? So let's say I take number 30 here and I put him on injury reserve, okay? Chances are the amount of information, the identity of my posterior distribution, no offense to number 30, may not be that much uh, with him not on the team, okay? And let's say I take another random guy and I say, you are no longer on the squad because you want to go play baseball or you want to go shoot Space Jam or something like that, right? With that person, that individual not on the team, I might actually have uh, quite a big loss, right? So what we can study this is we can iteratively cycle through each of our variables and figure out how much information on my posterior is, is, is lost without each person being around uh, in the data. So we do this via KL divergence. Effectively what we do is we say, I want to study the, the, the marginal distribution of my variables having marginalized out the variable of interest versus the conditional distribution with that variable being set to zero. Okay, so the 
idea of like that variable being around the information being included versus that variable be conditioned set to zero. If the KL divergence between these two distributions uh, is, is the same, this idea that the KL divergence is zero, that's interpreted as that variant or that topological summary statistic uh, is not a key explanatory variable relative to the others. Okay? So this is zero if and only if like these things are completely equal. Yeah? Do you need to repeat the model to do this? No. So once I have the post, there's a close, so it's a really good question. Uh, we in this paper and what we do in a lot of our papers is we just assume that this, if these things are normal, you can fit this from an uh, iterative process without having to refit it. Um, and then this KL difference has closed form. And it's really, yeah. yeah. Maybe that also answers my question. I was going to say, what, how is this different from just running sort of like the iteration test with sort of more standard classic or whatever? Guess there's a refitting the process that we don't need either. Yeah. And so as n gets large, that could be super costly to continue to refit. Um, um, so what we do here in our, our methods is we scale. So we do this relative centrality here. What that gives us is this idea of, a, of what we call um, a, a significance measure kind of threshold thing. This idea that the relative centrality of important variables are going to be uh, over 1 over p, right? The number of predictors in my model, right? If everybody's about the same, I have a team of a bunch of bunch bench players, then they're all going to contribute about the same amount of information as the others, OK? So really quick, I can show you this as a simulation. Um, let's, say I have, let's say I have three features. Oops. Um, 20, I have 25 features. Let's say my, I have three causal features. I'm going to call these causal features uh, Jordan, Pippin, and Rodman. Um, let's say that uh, I'm going to simulate data uh, according to all tw these three are the only ones that have non-zero effects. Okay? Uh, what a genetics person might say, which is what one of my reviewers said, is that 50% of phenotypic variance is too high. That's absolutely true, but I want to I show you as a proof of concept like how this works. right? Uh, and so in the paper I say like this is a proof of concept simulation. Um, and this is, this is how it works. So what we see here is when we run our model, we, do we iteratively do this rate measure for each thing. We have uh, the Jordan, Pippin, Robbins as, as the most significant features, and everyone else is, is, is not so much. What's really interesting, going back to this 1 over p line here, is it kind of serves as where the null is. So what you can do is you can also iteratively condition on two players being out at a time. Right? So let's say that I say I want Jordan to be out as well as iteratively each player out together, right? I condition on losing Jordan and every other player individually. What's really cool about this is it's like an actual athletic team, right? If I lose Jordan and then I, what happens is I have to make up for those 40 points somewhere, right? And so the relative centrality of the other players goes up, right? Like their importance rises kind of all equally because they're not the same. So you still have these, you have Pippen and Robin, still your most important players. But as a, as a result, everyone else kind of rises together, right, but up to this line. I can do this iteratively until I have effectively like no more bench players, right? And so in the paper, we show as, as like this concept uh, is at least makes makes sense as a whole, right? You can do checks just to make sure if I take out one of the, if I take out number thirty instead, right? Like nothing kind of changes. Um, we can also have a situation where I simulate data under just noisy situation, so everyone's kind of noise. And everyone kind of hovers around this line, so I have like no causal features, right? So this is the Adams and Clyde stats paper that I'll show, uh, that I'll give the link to after. Um, so that's what we're going to use for our, our evidence measure, right? Of course, you don't have to use this nonlinear metric. You can use any kind of variable selection technique you have, and it's not your pipeline software has a ton of options. You don't have to use. Yeah. Just mapping from the fourth analogy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> back to the to the the, the players of features. Yeah. That are involved, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and so these features in, in our case are going to be the topological curves statistics. And do those map back to topological features? Like, uh, They're going to do topological features themselves. Yeah, so instead of using um, like a genotype vector, we're going to use the, that Euler characteristic curve vector that I had. And I'm going, to, I'm going to use the rate measure to select which of those topological features are most important. Yeah. I can imagine situations where I have multiple features um, where it's important to have at least one of them? Like yes. Like have all of them this together or something like that? Yeah, this is an excellent question. Is this an issue you run into? So this is an issue that we didn't run into in the simple case that we were looking at. I did this with, we did this within the genetics context, but you can, in genomics, there are a ton of places where you might have like passenger driver mutations, those kind of ideas. We did not explore that in that space, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
easy next thing to kind of think about is if I moved from not just like genetics where we're just trying to deal with like LD and things like that, but if I actually moved to a place where the, the effect of one thing can actually be masked by these other processes, right? And so we didn't think about that at all, but that's something that we, I definitely want to in the future. Yeah, definitely. Um, so after we do, do these three steps and I get, I have an idea of which parts of my curve are most important versus the other parts of the, the topological curves for my other shapes, um, we do this reconstruction algorithm. And the reconstruction algorithm is really nice. What we say is um, there's this really nice paper um, from my old advisor and, and some of his friends where they take these directions of these cones and they show that if I do these topological sweeps over a cone of directions, so some sort of directions that are, that are uh, somewhat uh, uh, close to each other, then the information or topological information across them is quite similar. Okay? So what we do is we use that as a way to pick a cone of directions, we do our topological sweeps, and as, as a way of, to figure out if evidence of like this topological feature actually matters, we want to make sure that th that topological feature appears as important across all directions within that cone. Okay? So, um, and then we take the, the union of all those map vertices. So how this works is I take a cone of directions, I do my sweeps across these cones. There's these planes that are projection on those things. And then we find the intersection of all of the of the significant regions of all those or the significant features within that cone. We could do this for all cones until at some point we have highlighted the entire shape. Um, so that's how the reconstruction works. Um, so why I'm happy that all of you are here with your expertise is Sinatra is a really cool pipeline, but the real gem to me about it is how you do simulations and assess things. So I took that completely for granted because no one's done this before. Uh, there's not a framework for it. Um, and so one reason why we did classification is because there's a way to check whether we're doing things right or wrong. Doing things from a continuous observation perspective is hard. Because if you think about it, what I need to do is I need to simulate shapes with characteristics that explain the variation of a, of a continuous outcome. And I need to be able to then check whether I need to be able to control how much variation they're explaining, right? So things that we're able to do in genetics, I can't necessarily do here with shapes. So case control is a little bit easier, so I'll show you what we did. So it's a proof, proof of concept simulation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take spheres, and I'm going to create those features that create that variation, OK? So I we, have, we select a set of shared regions by these cusps. Um, so these cusps are shared across these two groups. Then we're going to create causal regions, which are these red dents. And I'm going to put these red dents in um, uh, regions around noise for this group and another set of regions around noise for another group. So these are like these red cusps are like the true positives, and the rest of the features are, are, are false positives. And then what I want Sinatra to be able to do is identify these red regions, obviously, according, uh, over anything else, right? These ver the vertices here versus the vertices anywhere else, OK? And so what's really cool about this is our, our idea for performance is very similar to what you would think about in genetics. When the architecture of my trait is sparse, the effect of, those, uh, of the one causal region is large. And as I have more and more causal regions, like in a polygenic type of trait architecture, the effect size of each of these things, the amount of variance that each of these things explain gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, which means that they're harder and harder to find. Um, so that was actually really cool that we were able to connect this to things that we do in, in typical biology. And so we do this, like, these different scenarios where we try to figure out where we're losing power and stuff like that. Um, we also did this really cool thing where we know what the null setting is. So the null hypothesis, if you mentioned, remember from Sinatra, is that everyone is contributing to my variance of my output. It's just that some players are contributing more, right? So the null hypothesis happens in two regions here. Um, the one case where I have two shapes that are almost identical, right? In this case, Sinatra shouldn't be able to tell like what's a causal feature. They're all they're all equally causal to Sinatra, right? Like they're all explaining the same amount of variance, and so Sinatra is going to say, "Well, they're all I, they're indistinguishable." The other case is where two shapes are completely different. In that case, in this case, no one's important, so they're all equal. In this case, they're all important, so they're all equal. And so, Sinatra needs, so for Sinatra to be powerful, it needs to, you had to have something in the middle, right? Hence why 
in, in situations like the soft tissue, where things are, are, can be super variable, you need to somehow model, I, th I think, the underlying manifold where these things might live to, 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 to establish what is different and what is the same. Um, so those are the null situations. We also did this with more uh, real data. So I did this teeth characterization where we uh, took CT scans from actual teeth and then we created causal features from the teeth via like characterization. So this is how it kind of works. Uh, we take a tooth and I create two classes from this tooth by selecting landmarks and then like elongating them and kind of making them the causal features for this class. And I select another set of teeth features and then I do it for the second class, right? All from the same tooth. And so I do this with some noise and I, tell some, and I want Sinatra to be able to identify these red regions for this group and these red regions for this group. And then you can see its performance here. Um, the same thing of what we saw with the spheres holds here. As I do more characterizations, meaning I make these teeth look crazier and crazier with different, uh, with, with different, different landmark points. So if I go from three to five, my power goes down. Right? So when I only have a few of those features, it does really well. When I, when I start increasing in difficulty, same thing, this polygenic type of idea, you start to lose that um, feature. Um, the last thing that we did with this, and I'll kind of talk about what, we're, what else we have going in the lab, is uh, we did this with actual real teeth. So um, here we have 59 different molars from four different genres of, of, uh, of primates. Uh, the cool thing about this, this sample, or this example, is there's also a ground truth here. So Doug Boyer is really helpful in the sense that these tarsiers have retained a, a cusp in their lower molar that the others haven't because they choose certain foods and they have to be able to digest, digest those foods. And so what we wanted to show was that Sinatra was able to identify uh, this cusp. Um, and we had this observation that this might be determined based on where in the phylogenetic tree these, these monkeys are, right? So this idea of the null hypothesis, we didn't. It, it might be harder to identify this cusp if the if the primates are too related to each other, meaning that they're too similar. Um, and so here we have the phylogenetic relationships, where over millions of years uh, these these primates split off in their own tree, and then you have this here. Um, so we had this hypothesis that these comparisons might be easier than this than overall this group's comparison, um, and that's kind of what you see is it's still able to identify it, but we did this like this test to figure out how likely it is that this might be found by chance, and it's much lower here than it is for this group. And so we do a bunch of different other uh, assessments for that, for that method. Um, ongoing work in the, in the group is, uh, particularly in this space, but in other spaces, um, We've been exploring Sinatra with different probabilistic type models. And so part of what my group is working on is this thing called biologically annotated neural networks. They're these partially connected networks that are defined by annotations in the data. So what we do is we take hierarchical studies in, in genetics, and we would recognize that if I take a Manhattan plot, which is basically like SNPs along the genome, SNPs along the genome are characterized for a given gene in a given region. And then genes are annotated for pathways and signaling cascades, right? If you take that structure and you flip it on its axis, it's just a neural network that's just partially connected, right? SNPs should be funneled into regions that are based on where they are in the genome, and these are genes. Um, and you could do the same thing with genes to pathways, like can funnel how things are. What we do is we make this entire thing probabilistic so you can actually learn the sparse architecture or the hierarchical nature of the, of the method. One question, yeah. We are kind of red lead though, because they have distal regions that are now cold. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, no, that's a really good question. So um, what we do here is a few things. Um, we do this like variational EM algorithm. We're in it. We actually con we try to control for that as like a like a mixed effect, like a random effect type of idea. Um, what's cool about this is you also use summary statistics here. So if we don't have access to the individual level data, this structure still holds, and then you just take the uh, some like OLS effect size type thing here. You can you, instead of using this X, uh, the genotype matrix here, you can actually put L, the LD matrix here. Um, so we've been exploring this in the context of structures of other spaces, right? We kind of have this hierarchical nature of data, and it'd be cool to kind of mix this in with some of the shape stuff that we're doing. Um, also, doing multi-omic data here would be cool. So not just genotypes, but multi different types of sequencing. So. Um, 
we're now moving to Sinatra to, like I said before, soft tissues. And so what I want to get back to, obviously, is my ultimate goal of doing this. Um, so now that we're able to show that we do variable selection, how do we make Sinatra better? Um, and, and how do we make it for more heterogeneous groups? And so what we want to do is identify uh, physical characteristics of the brain that are linked to these oncogenic signatures. Um, and so this band paper will be out in two weeks, and so I would love for, to share that with people if they're interested in this. Um, but the soft tissue question is a big thing where theoretical questions are still uh, need to be worked out as well as like implementation things. So we've been thinking about that with people uh, at the Broad and people at Duke and uh, people at Brown as well. So um, it'd be cool to do just like microscopy images and, and, and pathology and things like that. Um, uh, these structures can be quite large as you can see and so this is quite dense and so trying to deal with that density is also kind of interesting. Um, so with that, I kind of want to thank everyone for, for paying attention and listening and your great questions. And um, uh, this the Sinatra thing actually was led by an undergrad, which is kind of cool. Um, and then I have a lot of collaborators, and then people like give us money for stuff, um, which is kind of nice. And uh, uh, here's some references and stuff. So cool. Thanks. Thanks for having me. time domain, especially for the tumors. So you're, you're getting a sample at a specific moment in time, mm -hmm. uh, and the tumor's growing and changing. What do you think about that? So what we've been doing thus far from limitation of data is we've been taking shapes. Um, so what happens is you get diagnosed, you get an MRI scan, scan right away, and then you go into surgery right away. We've been taking those initial MRI scans. So we try not to confound ourselves with different treatment strategies and things like that. So people you get diagnosed, you get an MRI, uh, you, you go under the knife and you go chemo right away. And so we try not to get those secondary things because those can kind of confound analyses. What I would love to have is more of a time series type thing, but I don't know, we haven't thought about how to incorporate that information just yet. Um, we, for some of these shape studies that we have, they're not um, GBM, we do have like time series RNA-seq data from, from people across the street. Um, It'd be nice to kind of imp in, like to, to incorporate some of that temporal information, but we haven't really thought about that too much yet. Um, I think it's because of this irregularity of what happens at the second and third steps of the diagnoses for people across hospitals. I haven't thought about how I'd like to normalize that situation yet. Um, but it's a, it's a place to kind of think about. Following on that, I mean, I guess, you know, I was trying to think about some of the causal inference type of issues yeah. here, and it's hard, right? It feels like it's hard because you don't really have hypotheses, right? So you're kind of just looking for what looks influential, and, right? But in relation to the time series, it seems like that would be interesting because I imagine as people are getting sicker, you'd expect that if there was a causal effect to be located and things that are changing over time. Absolutely. Right? So and I, what important. I would hope is, what I would hope is that the amount of data is going to be more available. So uh, what you've seen is like an explosion of this, uh, this imaging and stuff and so um, the, the lack of hypotheses is a big thing though definitely um, it becomes less clear so when you move away from anthropology it becomes even less clear what you should be looking for right so anthropology you kind of know because people have like really studied these animals or organisms for like a super long time and so there's, there's kind of a right answer for some of these things um, there's not so much a right answer for the, for the oncology stuff uh, outside of being able to identify something and have someone do experimental validation, but there could be something to kind of think about as well. Yeah. We don't have access to those people at Brown, so that would be cool to, to really, yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. Yeah. Um, back to the brain tumor, mm -hmm. do you think you could use the same technique by taking a, a um, by looking, could you predict whether a treatment is working or not earlier on in the course of treatment from the techniques you already have? Yeah, so I think there are, there are a few things that we would need to do to think about the brain. One is space and location. We don't take that to account, but any radiologist would tell you that's like a massive thing of where it is in the brain is going to probably depend on survivability um, or whether treatment efficacy and things like that. Um, we don't take into account texture, which a lot of things with CT scans you have. You have this idea of, of density in different regions of the brain. We don't, we don't take into account that stuff either. Um, um, and, and what I would want to do, I think, 
is, like I said before, kind of learn the underlying geometric manifold that these things kind of live in. And I think what you would want to do is you want to control on those as random effects, and then that might give you an idea of how relevant the shape actually is. Um, and so I think there are, uh, there are things that we need to improve upon first. I think they're doable, but I, I think that uh, everything that I had thought about was going to be super easy. We, <laughs> after I did the teeth, I realized that the soft tissue thing is a much different question. Um, and so we, we may want to think about that. I've also think of, thought about starting at other cancer types that may not have as many random variables. The thing that's nice about the brain, though, is there's only, there's so, much, there's only so much places that the brain can go. There's another question here, which is other hallmarks of cancer. So metastases and things like that. We haven't thought about how to deal with that stuff. And also you can have brains that are co-located. So you have tumors on this half and this hemisphere of the brain also. We haven't thought about those kind of questions either. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can kind of think about how to control for and stuff like that. So we, there's a lot of work I think that's up there. Great. Thank you. No, thanks for your question. Thank you. It was awesome.